Welcome to Tony at 12. I'm Tony LeBlanc and my guest today is Emily Wordley, a researcher at the University of Huddersfield, uh, now heading towards her PhD. Emily recently visited Alderney to carry out an exercise in community input on tidal power. Emily, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Great to and, speak to you. And did you enjoy Alderney? Yes, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I didn't I did want to leave. Uh, <laughs> lovely place. Um, very jealous of everyone who lives there. Okay. Well, let, let's first of all talk about your entry into academia because did you did you have a plan right from the start that you were going to take the science route and um, go from there? No, actually, um, I've always said after I finished each degree, I'm not going back into academia and here I am now <laughs> doing a PhD. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did my undergraduate at Leeds University yeah. and that was in ecology and environmental biology um, and then actually had a year out and um, working for an within an environmental role and then I decided to do um, my master's and that was really based on my undergraduate so from within my undergraduate I did a year's placement um, and I was looking at research of um, conservation of sharks and rays and that really sparked my interest in the marine side of things. Um, and then my, my master's in marine environment and management. Um, from that, I then worked um, for Coastal Partnership. I was actually working with the local communities in Somerset to try and um, on campaigns and projects about the bathing water quality. So that sort of merged my interest of marine with um, community work and trying to get communities involved in environmental discussions and research. Um, and then actually I decided then that actually I wanted to do a PhD. Um, so was, I guess it brought all of my interests together. Um, and my research is looking at community engagement with marine renewable energy. Okay, so I, I mean, yeah. looking, looking at your um, CV to date, it appears to be a grand tour of Yorkshire. Yes, I seem to, somehow I seem to be staying around Yorkshire. Yeah. I don't know. Why? It's a, I mean, it's a lovely place. Um, Absolutely. And York, York, where you did your master's, is a lovely city, isn't it? Yeah, they're all so different. All the universities are so different. But York, specifically, the city is, yeah, beautiful mm. city. Now, you're now at Huddersfield. And um, quoting from their website, they say, what a world-leading applied research groups in biomedical sciences, engineering and physical sciences, social sciences and arts and humanities. So obviously they, as, as a university, they've got a certain slant on what they uh, try to uh, achieve. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really, it's a well-recognised university for, I think it gives all of undergraduates have the opportunity to do an industrial placement year. And I think that's one of the key things that's really useful from Huddersfield is that obviously a lot of people now these days have a degree and actually just stand out and particularly when you're trying to get a job, having just a degree sometimes isn't enough. So having the placement year and that opportunity is really, really useful for um, yeah getting a job after university. So 100% of undergraduates have that opportunity, which I think was really beneficial for me at Leeds. Um, I definitely think that helped me to get jobs um, after that. But yeah, there's a variety of different um, departments at the university. I'm in the School of um, Applied Sciences. And within that, there's various different departments. So mine's the Department of Biological and Geography, Geological Sciences. Um, but yeah, it is a really, really great university. Yeah. And, you know, all the facilities are good, good campus and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, actually, most of my, so my second year at the moment, my first year was really sort of at the end of lockdown so I've only really been able to start going into the university now um, and the, yeah there's a lot of um, postgraduate facilities and shared space and shared offices so um, it's a bit different I guess when you're doing a PhD unlike your undergraduate you're sort of on your own mm. um, everyone's PhD is completely different so you don't really have um, as much conversation with some of the students as you would usually um, but it is good to have the broad range of experiences in different um, research areas for the PhD yeah. student. So, so, I mean, you, you found it relatively easy to sort of almost do home studying, as it were. Yeah, it's become normal now, actually, isn't it? Um, yeah. Like, team interviews and online interviews seem to be um, easier, and I guess, yeah, it's more accessible, I guess, in terms of the environmental perspective, it's good for, for that way, you know, saving on transport and um, transport costs as well. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just become a, a, a normal thing. Really. And, and you have a supervisor, don't you, in, in terms of the PhD? Yeah, so I actually have three supervisors, mm -hmm. um, so two of them at Huddersfield and one of them's um, at Salford University. And actually, it's quite unique in terms of their, quite, um, their research areas are very different. 
mm. which is quite beneficial because I guess interdisciplinary research can they, they can offer different slants and different perspectives on things. So one, one of them is like a social science. Um, it's got expertise in that. One of them is quite a marine base and one of them is more focused on dunes, but they've got a variety of different experiences. Um, and I think that's quite useful and interesting to have as a mix um, of expertise. How do you split your week between supervisors? Oh, between supervisors? Well, I've got a lead supervisor, so yeah. all of my inquiries go to him. Yeah, and okay. Um, we all have meetings um, every so often all together, um, depending on their availability. But yeah, we do have a lead supervisor. It can get a bit, I guess, confusing. <laughs> now, um, obviously, this question of academic research um, for governments, NGOs, commerce and industry is very important these days, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, on the ground, research is really, really important. Having someone who, well, particularly PhDs, I guess, because, you know, broadly money and time is quite scarce so having like a dedicated three to four years where you get funding for a particular area of research is really valuable because you can go more in depth than you perhaps would for you know a small grant of pot of money that you get here and there for a small project you can only go so far with uh, the quality of research so phds and research in that from an academic perspective is really useful because they're quite rigorous in the way they have to be peer-reviewed before they're published so experts in the field you write up your thesis or paper, for example, and then have to be peer reviewed by um, two or three members of um, yeah. staff in a similar area of research. So there is a rigorous procedure to make sure that, you know, the quality is there and it's following the right ethics and the methodology. So um, I guess thinking about it from an energy perspective, um, climate change, on the ground research, looking at new technologies for um, renewable energy, for example, tidal and offshore um, wave, having researchers that are on the, on the ground discovering new technologies are crucial for governments when they're setting their, their targets for um, decarbonisation, um, NGOs when they're looking at campaigns and projects and um, where they target their funding and things like that. So I think research is incredibly important um, in, for everything really. And of course, as an academic, you're independent you haven't got a particular axe to grind. So it's not as if, you know, government's going to a commercial organisation and saying, uh, can you provide information? Because that commercial organisation might, might well sort of take the view that if they sort of deliver it one way, they may gain out of it. Whereas you're, as far as you're yeah. concerned, you're not going to do that, are you? Yeah, so my research, I mean, it depends on the PhD, really, because some, some do have collaborations with different yeah. organisations. Um, and mine is, um, so it's the Engineering Physical Research Council. So it's funded by, the, the UK has got a big part of different, um, different PhD fundings and it sits within that. Um, so broadly speaking, you know, I, I've, I am very much funded by the UK government, um, but it's, it's not, they don't direct my research oh. eyes. I'm completely independent um, with my research. And um, yeah, other, yeah, others do have connections, but mine is completely independent. So yeah, there's no tie-ins, there's no one, um, sort of directing or swaying my point of view which I guess is a good how did you way. how did you pick up Alderney as a uh, a method you know as, as as a subject so yeah so my broadly um, I applied for my PhD was in marine renewable energy and community engagement and so my first year was really looking at all the literature that was out there at the moment and identifying the gaps in the research so Currently, there's been a lot of research on the um, sort of environmental and economic impacts of um, renewable energy developments, but less so on the community interactions, um, and particularly um, tidal and wave. Because they're newer technologies, there's been less research on that um, and community interactions. So I wanted to focus on that, that newer technology and then trying to identify a case study side that had had proposals. Um, there's only a few locations that have you know actually developed the tidal um projects and they're mainly focused in scotland so there's been mm. quite a lot of research over there um but less so in other locations and i i sort of came across alderney within my research i think it was just a paper that i found or speaking to an individual that said that had been proposals in alderney and um, so actually identifying a location that has had proposals is quite difficult so yeah that's really how i came across alderney and obviously being a island community um, obviously there's a lot of um, marine environment surrounding that so um, and typically there's a lot of historical and cultural connections with the marine environment so actually examining 
um, an island community, I think is quite important to see mm. what factors might influence development or what communities' perceptions are towards that, because um, there's a lot of factors that can influence people's perceptions, um, the value of the sort of marine environment and the historical um, connections and things like that. So yeah, that's really how I came across. Okay, so so the aims of the current research, can you give us a bit more detail on that one? Yeah, um, so yeah, I'm focusing on community engagement with renewable energy, but particularly on um, so people's experiences of community engagement. So first of all, um, I'm looking to explore what's actually happened in Alderney, what proposals have there been? Um, and secondly, people's perceptions towards these proposals, how do they feel about those um, developments? And then what communicate community engagement was delivered um, and how were people involved in those discussions about those um, planned developments. They might not be because it might not have you know, got to that stage. Um, but if they have, what community engagement was delivered and what do people feel about how that went? Do they have any recommendations for the future? Um, do they feel that they um, could be involved in more or less? Um, so from that initial research, I'm hoping to develop some sort of guidelines for recommendations for community engagement in legislation um, because when I consider for example the UK um, even within England, Scotland, Wales is um, looking at the legislation in more detail it's quite unclear where um, community engagement occurs and the quality of engagement so there's a lot of factors you know quality engagement and the timing of engagement can be influential to people's perceptions mm. and how the project actually goes through if it's successful in terms of actually, which is commercialization. Um, so, so you put, as, as far as you're concerned, community input, okay, it's fine as far as Alderney goes, but really you feel that many major projects in the UK need this sort of community input. Yeah, I think, you know, community engagement is a requirement, mm. um, but, you know, the level of, um, and community engagement can vary. Um, so looking at examples, um, some projects, you know, it can be seen as like a tick box, tick box yeah. tick exercise where, you know, you just do it and then that's it, it's completed. But actually engaging with the community and actually using that information and decision-making or considering that is really important. And particularly yeah. from a community's perspective, if they've invested all this time, you know, engaging with the project and giving their input and then their, their um, knowledge isn't actually used, it can, you know, be off-putting and, they might not want to be engaged in the future and their perceptions towards that development might be altered if they feel that they not really have a say in that. So, um, you know, there's been examples where communities haven't been consulted well and then is left to, you know, campaigning against that project and the project hasn't gone through. So when we're thinking about, um, you know, moving towards um, um, more renewable energy, I think community engagement is really, really key, mm. um, making that transition more smooth. So how do we avoid nimbyism? <laughs> Not in yeah. my backyard. <laughs> yeah, well, that's actually really interesting because, you know, offshore wind and wind, obviously you can see it. Yeah. Um, NIMBY is one of the key things that was considered in research, um, to be social science research is like a key factor that can influence people's perceptions. Um, and there is a perception as well that, um, you know, tidal power is under the water, so people can't see it. Mm. But uh, I know obviously in Alderney, there's been discussions about that might you know, sometimes there needs to be a converter station, for example, yeah. or some things that have, are on land. So actually, sometimes it isn't really, you know, as invisible as people think. Mm. And um, it'll be interesting to explore, and I guess that's what I'm doing with my research, how people receive um, newer technologies such as tidal power. And um, because, yeah. you know, there's still answers that are unknown. We don't really know what it will look like because there's so many different options that are being, you know, trialed and things like that. So, yeah, NIMBY is... Um, something that's still discussed but you know it's sometimes yeah not as discussed as much anymore but i think the fact of the matter is that people just have to accept that in the age in which we live we yeah. desperately need <clears throat> as much clean energy as we can get hold of and sacrifices have to be made to to attain that both financially and aesthetically yeah yeah definitely i mean there's so many factors that need to be considered and it's a case-by-case -case basis so yeah, there's, you know, economic, environmental impacts. And I guess that's where research is so important to see, you know, sometimes something just have to, you know, give way for another area that is needed. And, you know, we do need to um, move away from fossil fuels um, urgently. Yes, quite. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the way the world is at the moment, 
<clears throat> we're sort of going back slightly into fossil fuels at least for the time being unfortunately but there you go that's yeah. one of those things um as far as you're concerned are you able to say how many people you saw on Alderney so I interviewed I've already interviewed about 20 people yeah um, okay I'm going to go back and do more interviews as well yeah yeah and so actually um I just ran out of time there was more yeah. in well into the interview but he just didn't have enough time he's only there for two weeks so my next um i'm hoping to go back in october to mm -hmm. do some further interviews with people um and also a video interviews which is part of my research as well i'm looking at um participatory film mm -hmm. so i'm exploring um how people can engage with projects or research in um sort of with with film and film interviews so i'll be doing that uh, again in october so i'm hoping to interview more people then as well so it's not too late for people that didn't get interviewed first time round to participate. So that's good news. No. <laughs> now, in terms of the data that you you, you collect, um, obviously it's going to be a bit better than uh, is it Survey Monkey or Chip Monkey Chimp Survey Chimp? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> or Trust Pilot. Um, mm -hmm. ha, do you actually have to devise a program to? be able to analyze the data or do, do, has how does Phil got a general program that's capable of carrying out the functions that you require yeah so it just depends on your research question um, and how you frame and what method you use so because i'm using semi-structured interviews so there is some structure to the interviews as key themes i want to explore but actually i leave the interviews quite open so people can actually um expand on their points and give their experiences in, the much, in as much depth depth as they want to um, my research is qualitative information so not really um, numbers or anything like that so I have to use a qualitative software so I use um, in vivo and mm. a lot of people use this software so you sort of input you transcribe the interviews through a software and then you go through it manually to make sure there's no errors and then you upload it to the software and it pulls out key themes for you okay. and then you go through and pull out key themes yourself and sort of see what's being um, from this common theme and then you can produce a lot of infographics and things like that. So it varies really on um, your methods, what sort of um, software you use. Um, but that's really the approach that I'll be taking for mine. Um, but it just depends on what I, I guess I find out um, over my next interview. So I'm only just transcribing the interviews at the moment. I still need to undercover what I'm exactly going to analyse it with. But I suppose the great thing about it is that you can then add the second tranche of interviews into the software. Yes, yeah, you can. Yeah. yeah. So, so you've got an evolving situation as far mm -hmm. as your information is concerned. Um, yeah. where, where do you see um, you're going to, when, when do you think you're going to be able to complete the project? Have you got a deadline or? So, yeah, I've got two more years left. Um, yeah. And at the end, we have to produce a, a thesis, which is a huge document. Um, and, but I'm hoping to, so within that, you have to have chapters. Um, and hopefully I'm going to write papers for each chapter. Yep. The aim is to try and get those published as I go through. Um, and getting things published is a long process. You have to get it fair reviewed, like I mentioned before. So um, I'm hoping to publish those before I finally complete my thesis. So each chapter will be a different sort of subject area that I'm going to examine. Um, so hopefully um, I, haven't, I need to analyse the data. So yeah. I mean, within the next year, hopefully I can hopefully have one paper at least or... But it, I think it's, it is a quite a long process to get those published. Out of interest, who owns the copyright? <laughs> so, um, the author is usually the first owner of the copyright. Yeah. Um, but, for example, when you're publishing, you know, typically um, the copyright can be transferred to that publisher, depending yeah. on the journal you use. So, but yeah, it's normally transferred, but generally the thesis itself is the author. And then the papers, you know, will be normally transferred. Does 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 the university have any copyright? Um, what? How can I put it? Copyright rights <laughs> to it? I mean, I have to delve into that a bit more detail. But um, normally, typically, the thesis are open access, so yeah. uh, anyone can really access the the thesis. Um, but I'll have to. Yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure on the exact copyright that the university would own. Hmm. Um, so that's, that's something to put on the list yeah yeah 
<laughs> or something for them to put on their list, perhaps. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, when you eventually publish, it'll be available online, presumably. Yeah, so I'm um, hoping, oh, all the people I've interviewed have given them the option if they want to hear back um, yeah. about it. So I'm sending it out to all those people who participated and also to um, Alderney, um, or as many people as I can share it with them. So hopefully it'll be useful to them or interesting. Mm. Um, um, but it will be open access. So um, it'll be online on the journal. People can, uh, can send the link out and people can access it themselves. Okay, that's interesting. Now, you can't go any further than a PhD, can you? Academically? You can. Yeah, I mean, you always think it's the end after the yeah. but Actually, you can do a postdoctoral research as well. So that, that is an option. Typically, that is the usual option that people do following a PhD. So you go into further research in a subject area um, with additional funding. Yeah. Um, you tend to do more lecturing and things like that as well and delivering some of the lectures and modules as well. So going through those. So that could be an option for me. Um, I just need to explore that, what exactly which area I'd go into. If you don't, it seems that Huddersfield's got a really good um, record for providing employment, you know, or finding sources of employment for postgrads. They say they, they've placed 98.4%. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that is that is really good. Um, and yeah, I think it's based on well, postgraduate, but um, hopefully we'll have a lot of experience and enough to get a job by the end of it. That's the aim. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, you, you know, you're not ruling anything out at this stage. You could stay in acad academia for the rest of your life. Or you could, you know, go into the world of commerce and industry. Yeah, yeah. I think my um, at the moment, I think I'm just going to probably stay in academia. Um, I don't know what actually what exact area of research I'll be going into. Obviously, linked to my research now, but um, there's, I mean, I could do about five different PhDs on the information I've gathered already. So um, I'm not sure what area I'll go into, but I can't. You, you can obviously diversify and go back into. Um, yeah, not the academic route. So well, I think these days lots of people go in and out, don't they? Almost, you yeah. Know, they'll they'll have a bit of experience in um, the commercial world, perhaps, and then go back to academia and vice versa. So I think that's quite good as well. I think some of the lectures that I really remember are people who've you know worked in both and applied the research to real life in their roles and stuff, and have that experience as well. So I think well, I've already gone in and out, so I'll probably continue doing that. Mm. Um, just to have a bit of a break, I guess, from, from re research. <laughs> Emily, really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much for sparing Thanks. me some time. And, um, you know, look forward to having a, a further chat in the future as uh, the project progresses. Yeah, it'll be great to talk to you again. Yeah, Thank you. that's good. Thank you. Okay. Right, so there we are. Um, I'll give you a bell in a few minutes on the mobile. Oh, great. Yes. Sounds okay. good. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.